Hello, I'm Rob Caleb, Head of Clinical Policy and Strategy at Verily Life Sciences and Google Health, and I'm really delighted to be joined by Jess Mega, our Chief Medical Officer. Jess, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Jess Mega, and I'm a Verily co-founder and our Chief Medical and Scientific Officer. It is really great to be here uh, with you today, Rob. You know, we used to be sort of in co-opetition when you were working in the Timmy Group doing clinical trials, and I was at Duke. And it's really been fun to see the evolution of Verily. You were there from the start. Why was the clinical trials platform a key issue for Verily right from the start? Well, I certainly, I remember all of our history before and it's been such a pleasure to be able to work together now. You know, at Verily, you know, we've always believed that through data we could answer important questions. And these were questions that, that meant, meant something to people so that they could enjoy healthier lives. And we knew very early on that through data, we were gonna be able to improve diagnoses, reinforce healthy behaviors, get treatments to market faster. And what was most important, I think, through, through the lens was how do we help patients and clinicians on the front line who are trying to get the right treatment to the right patient at the right time? And when you asked about clinical research, we felt that clinical research was really all about data and insights. And it was just a natural area for us to focus on from the very beginning. Plus, I think that while huge, huge investments have been made in research, and I think even in, in our lifetime, Rob, we've seen um, the impact on research and care, but there's a lot of improvements that can be made with clinical research. And I think along with our partners, we have been on a journey to do just that. I sure agree, Jess. And you know, um, throughout my whole career, I've been concerned about the extraordinary expense and time delays that occur in clinical research when people are so dependent um, on getting the right answers. And as FDA commissioner, I felt it every day. So tell us about the platform and what's being built into it that will solve these problems. Yeah, so I think it's great that we have so many people who are committed to this, this mission. And the baseline platform is really an end-to-end -end evidence generation platform. And what it's designed to do is two key things. One is to accelerate scientific discovery and also importantly, lead to improved clinical outcomes. It's this idea that, that if you improve research, you improve care. And, and we see that all of the time. The only way that you get a new medicine or device or digital tool or even a new care pathway into the hands of clinicians and patients is, is through evidence. Now, what was really important to us uh, as we started on this journey in 2017 was to start with a patient-centric point of view. And so we started with the baseline health study, which is an incredibly ambitious longitudinal study. And in order to really do right by the participants, we built a digital platform that was there to capture data and engage participants throughout their entire journey. And we integrated new and novel ways of interacting with individuals, not just during their, their visits, their clinic visits, but throughout their entire research experience. And so really being patient centric has been one of the key pillars of the baseline platform. And really to be, to be so clear, participants have always been at the center. At the same time, we needed to do three additional things. To make trials more efficient and to enable decentralized trials, we needed to work on a trial system. And by that, I mean this unified digital platform to conduct trials. And when we talk to so many research in, in, researchers, including the both of us, what you start to hear about is fragmentation. And the trial system is bringing down fragmentation. The second thing is in order to create participation, I talked a minute ago about how important the participants are, but to get participants engaged, we came up with the concept of the baseline community. Communities, registries, recruitment services that allow participants to be part of that research experience. And then finally, and I think this is an extremely timely, timely concept, this idea of how do you capture and analyze real world data? And so at Verily, we have proprietary wearable sensors. We also work with third party sensors to think about digital biomarkers and how that's going to really redefine health and disease. And then also novel data that comes from molecular tools. So we needed to start with participants in mind and then make sure we thought about our trial systems, our communities, and what it really means to integrate real world data. So, uh, so that has been what we've been up to over the last few years that's led to this important moment today. Well, you know, when you talk about decentralization for somebody like me, who's spent a career doing clinical trials, it brings up a set of worries about the data. I mean, fragmented data can lead to um, interpretations that are difficult and contradictory data in the same data set. What are we doing about that? So 
the, the importance around data and data integrity, I think, is front and center because when you step back, we're really only only as good as our interactions with our participants, what people are experiencing, and the data. And so when we thought about the baseline trial system, we needed to make sure that it was a fully integrated system. So it starts with the interactions and recruitment of individuals, linking them to visits that are either on-site or virtual, and even remote monitoring. And if you start to harmonize these various tools and technologies, the data sets start to come together. And this idea of encouraging better data, and your point about reproducible data, has always been front and center to the trial system. The other piece that you bring up is, how do we think about some opportunities where a trial could be decentralized? Something where participants could be met where they live. And so it brings down the burden, really democratizing research. So we have some trials that are fully decentralized, but we also wanted to make sure that this, these types of tools and that the trial system could be used more ubiquitously. And so we've also been working on hybrid trials and even trials that start to capture much more complicated research, for example, when interventions are involved. So a really good example uh, of this is a study that we ran with the Duke Clinical Research Institute. And it's called the COVID-19 Safety Surveillance Study. What it is, is an innovative approach to a phase four research program with over 20,000 participants. Now, the way we started was with a registry where we engaged with healthcare workers. And this was before there were even therapeutics or vaccines available. And what we were really interested in is understanding both the physical and the mental health of people, of healthcare workers who are at the front lines. And in fact, we had a very, very broad definition of healthcare workers, physicians, nurses, people working in the respiratory centers, people working with food delivery. This was something where we wanted to think broadly about healthcare delivery. And what happened is we were then able to, over time, engage these same individuals to understand this phase four research program that was looking at the safety surveillance of, of a vaccine. So we were able to leverage many of the skills that we had been working on over the last few years. That is remote data capture, the electronic consent modules, electronic patient reported outcomes. And so we incorporated all of this in order to get real time evidence, real time enrollment numbers, so again, that we could do the best job as we ran the safety surveillance program. Well, I thought you did a really smart thing um, in putting together a round table of pharmaceutical companies that are deeply uh, involved in running hundreds of clinical trials and learning from them. I mean, the round table with Pfizer, Atsuka, Novartis, Sanofi, these are companies that basically make it or don't make it based on the outcomes and reliability of their clinical trials. What did you learn from them? So I think throughout the entire journey, we have learned from our partners. As, as I mentioned at the very beginning, our partners and will continue to be our participants in clinical research. But from there, we also worked with Duke and Stanford to build out the work from the baseline health study. We then went on to work with advocacy groups, for example, the American Heart Association. And then it's been really important if we're thinking about getting the best interventions, the best medicines, to patients, we absolutely needed the partners that you mentioned. And we've had a lot of, a lot of learnings over, over time for sure. I think the place I would, would start is one by thanking our partners uh, and, and also saying that across all of them, what we heard was this idea of thinking about participant-centered design. And this is gonna be even more important as we think about the world of decentralized trials and even hybrid trials, linking some decentralized features along with sites. And what we need to do is make the participant journey as easy as possible. And so what we've done is step back and, and we leverage some of our Google DNA and Google product management mindsets, uh, as well as our user experience principles and thought, how do we improve the experience for a given individual? And this individual might be the participant. And so we've spent time with participants actively co-creating the tools that we use we thought about what it means to be a site. Sites are incredibly busy. You have investigators, you have research coordinators trying to balance so many different, different uh, practices to get their work done. So we spend a lot of time with sites. And then as you mentioned, we spent a lot of time with sponsors and these particular partners. And what we've seen is that when we engage this user experience design principles, We've, we've had some really positive outcomes. And, and I'll point to two particular ones. One is that we've seen higher participant engagement. 
So when participants are engaged in the research, what happens is we have a higher completion of study assessments. And then the second piece is how do you retain, how do you keep participants involved in research? And we don't just talk about a small number of participants. We feel very strongly about getting representative participants. It's the only way that we're going to have a more democratized uh, assessment and, and really generalize the findings. I think it's great when you run a really narrow clinical trial, but what does it mean for all of the patients that are in front of us? If I think about my clinical practice, I want to make sure that whatever evidence is generated applies to the people who I see. So I think that's been one lesson of really thinking about user-centered design. Uh, another lesson uh, that's come out is, you know, this, this is a complicated space. And if you think about something like an interventional decentralized trial, you've got to think about all of the different moving pieces and all of the nuances. And certainly part of it can be solved with technology. I always think about the technologies, the fabric that holds the patient's hand, the, the PI's hand, the data, all of that. But there's also a lot of people involved who need to carry out research. And so we've been really thinking about where is it best to lead with a technology solution and where, on the other hand, is it for potentially best to really think about the human element. And you and I have spent a lot of time talking about it's probably gonna be at the intersection of, of both. The other thing as we were thinking about this and as you think about all the nuances, it's not just those individuals, but it's also working directly with our partners and sponsors. And you know, one, one area where we've invested is, is doing even things like extensive user acceptance testing, not just with one group or the other, but having our partner deeply involved in that. And when we have a dedicated team, what happens is we'll pick up on slightly different different pieces uh, of the puzzle. And I think we've been much, much stronger together. So I, I just wanna always take a moment and thank the partners that we have to date. They have been visionary and I think are truly doing exciting things in clinical research. And at the same time, we know that if we were gonna broadly have impact, we wanna continue to look to leverage our solutions that some of them that we talked about today for more trials. And it's only through that that we bring even more therapies to market faster and expand our impact and health. So uh, again, a huge thanks. And, and we, we look forward to continuing to work with them and, and with others. And, uh, and you know, I will say, Rob, uh, it's, uh, it's been so wonderful to be able to work with you on this because I have learned so much about your own dedication to thinking about research in an entirely different way. You've always pushed us uh, to think about the big problem. So I wanted to take an opportunity and, and ask you a question. And this, this question comes from the idea that, that digital clinical research is going to be evolving. So we know it's not, not a static entity. I think we've seen in our own experiences how much clinical research has changed. In fact, I remember the early days where everything was on paper. In some ways it was much simpler, there wasn't fragmentation, but it certainly was not gonna scale the way that we, that we currently have ambitions. And so research continues to evolve. There's gonna be a radical transformation, you know, even, even in the moment right now. So uh, I'm very curious as you think about th this digital clinical research landscape, what really comes top of mind to you is what are the next big frontiers? What's the next big innovation that we should be looking towards? Well, I'll talk about three things that um, have really fascinated me all along, but now is the time, you know, these things were capable of being envisioned three decades ago, but the technology just wasn't there. Now it is. So we need to make it happen. The first is one almost everyone's talking about now, electronic health records. How can it be that we're capturing all of this information for people and about people to deliver their health care? And then when we go to do research, we start all over again and act like we never had any information. And so I think now the ability to aggregate electronic health record data, to curate it, and to get answers is really an important element that's going to move along very quickly. I know people are frustrated because the quality of EHR data is not perfect, uh, but it's getting better by the day. And I'm very much heartened by the ability of the digital infrastructure to um, help solve the data curation issue uh, on, a, on a large scale. And of course, the law now declares that your electronic health records belong to you. And so an individual participant who wants to participate in research now has the ability to request the electronic health record data and the health system or hospital or practice is obligated uh, to deliver that information. Now, a lot of work to do to really make that happen in a way which is gonna be research ready, but we're getting there. 
The second area is one that we're very involved in across Alphabet, including Verily and Google, and that's uh, the digitization of biomarkers and images. Um, our ability to measure deep biology at a lower cost now and to apply um, techniques like artificial intelligence to understand what we now call the phenotype stack, one of my favorite names, to look from genes to proteins to metabolites, tissues, and organs, something that we've worked on together with American Heart Association and a big project called One Brave Idea. In addition to that, though, images, anything that um, is digitized now can be analyzed in a very different way. So wh whether it's the retina, the skin, uh, or pathology, um, we can now take advantage of digital technology to um, automate efforts which used to be incredibly labor intensive um, and now can be done at a much larger scale. Now this is evolving and of course the talk and the hope far exceeds the current capability but we're well on the way so we should be looking at that. And then finally it's something that you've talked about a lot already here and I know you've worked on tirelessly Jess and that's the issue of hybridization. You now if we really think about a clinical trial Often I like to call it, you know, what it's been historically called, which is a human experiment. We are trying to answer a question which may have relevance to a company. It may have relevance to a public health agency. It certainly has some relevance uh, to the people who are participating in the study and to the investigators. And so this entire ecosystem has to be able to work together to answer the question. And uh, you've correctly pointed out that it's been horribly inefficient because the manual nature of it all leads to these delays and fragmentation that make it hard to put things together. But now we can do that. Uh, the technology is no longer the limitation, but we've got to work out the human rules. How is it that we work together to streamline and make things efficient? Because after all, uh, a clinical trial is designed to answer a question. The question should lead to either better understanding of how biology works, better understanding of how a treatment works, or actually uh, making the final judgment about the risks and the benefits of the treatment, which of course is where I'm most interested in a lot of the public attention is. So for any of that to work, it requires um, integration of this complex ecosystem. In my view, that's what the baseline platform is designed to do. So I couldn't be more excited about this next phase uh, as we hopefully work with people across the ecosystem to make this work. So Jess, I think we've got a few more years of working on this, but I can see the progress and really enjoyed talking with you about it. Uh, it's um, been amazing to work with you on this, this journey. And I, I do think there is so much to be done to accelerate discovery. And as you said, it's uh, a lot of work ahead of us, but I can't imagine a more important area to focus on. So, so thanks for taking the time to, to talk today.